Hey, it's Marie Forleo, and you are watching Marie TV, the place to be if you want to create a business and life you love. Now, if money is an area of your life that you want to get better at, today's show is a must watch. David Bach is one of the most trusted financial experts and best-selling financial authors of our time. He's written nine consecutive New York Times bestsellers with over 7 million copies in print, including the titles Smart Women Finish Rich, The Automatic Millionaire, and Start Late Finish Rich. In addition to his books, David has helped millions through his seminars, speeches, and media appearances. He's the co-founder of AE Wealth Management, one of America's fastest-growing financial planning firms, and the founder of Finish Rich Media, a website dedicated to revolutionizing how people learn about money. David, thank you so much for coming back. You know how much I adore you. I'm so excited to be back with you. Thank you for having me back. Yeah. So um, first of all, The Latte Factor, The Latte Factor. Ooh. This book is amazing. So I texted David after uh, I read uh, kind of an advanced copy and it made me cry at the end and we're going to talk about that. But I highly, highly recommend this book for you and for everyone you know. David's been on the show before. We've talked about money before. It's one of my favorite topics in the world. And this book is perfect, especially I feel like for people who are intimidated by money or they're afraid to dive in or everything just feels so overwhelming, like books right. that are 600 pages, which again, I've read a lot of them, even thicker books of yours that are full and comprehensive. This one you can read in basically an hour, an hour and a half, and it is life-changing. But before we dive into money, I actually want to talk more about the book itself and books themselves. Because as you know, I'm uh, at the tail end, my book will be out September 10th, everything is figure outable. Oh my goodness, people. Lessons Great upon, title, by the way. Thank you. I'm so excited for you. Thank you. Lessons upon lessons upon lessons. And I wanted to highlight this because I don't think people understand. So you had, how long have you wanted to write this book? 14 years. 14 years. It's, I mean, literally, from the moment I did a show with Oprah on The Automatic Millionaire, yeah. which we talked about on a previous show with you. Um, we did an entire segment on the latte factor together, Oprah and I, where we did a reveal of a young woman who didn't believe she could save any money and sh showed her what her latte factor was and showed on stage what it could be worth. And that reveal was where we pulled back a sheet that was covering over a quarter of a million dollars in cash. Woo. And, it, and the audience did exactly that. It was like, whoa, and it was real money. Yeah. And I literally said, I'm sitting next to Oprah, I'm like, this is real money. And it was that aha moment. And I basically came home and I was like, I need to figure out a way to write a story that, that, that's shorter, that's simpler, that's easier, a parable. And I literally said to my publisher, I want to write the Who Moved My Cheese of money. Mm. I want to write a book that 98% of people won't read a book on money. Yeah. I want to write a little tiny story. And they were like, yeah, yeah, no, I don't, not, 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 no. Right. Not so much. And so I kept having this idea and I kept year after year throwing it back out there. And you have to think, no, nah, nah, not so much. And that's what happens sometimes, by the way. You know, people think, oh, you're an artist and you're, you've are you created a certain amount of success and that people just say yes to you. But it's not always what happens. That's so I, I wrote seven more books before I finally did this one. Yeah. Okay. So again, guys, like David Buck, nine consecutive New York Times bestsellers, millions and millions of copies that he's sold. And his publisher still said, no, I don't think so. So you actually took a different approach with this, right? You said this is the first book that you wrote first before selling it. That's exactly right. Yeah. So I finally, I reached that point. Sometimes you have a dream. And after you keep hearing no and you keep hearing no, that dream sort of dies off, right? Yeah. But what, what, what I always tell people is if it, if it keeps coming back, that's your soul talking to you. Right, like if there's something that you really want to do, and it's almost like you can't let it go, that's your soul saying you have to do this. Yeah. And I finally hit this point where I'm like, if ten years from now I haven't done this book, I'm gonna have serious regrets. Yes. So John Mann and I, my co-author of this book, because I never had a co-author, he wrote a great book called The Go Giver. Loved it. And I had done a testimonial for that book well over a decade ago, and I had said to John, I have this idea for this book called The Latte Factor where we can teach people all over the world that they're richer than they think, that they're more powerful than they know, that small amounts of money can change their life. But I don't have the whole idea yet. And when I have the whole idea, I'm going to call you. And so I finally called him and I'm like, I have the idea. You got to come to New York. I'm going to walk you through the story. And we literally, I walked him through the story. The story starts in the Oculus. And I said, I'm, but here's the thing. I don't want to sell the book first. I don't want to do the typical book proposal, sell it, write it. I go, I want to work with you on this book like a piece of artwork. 
And until I tell you it's ready, it's not ready. We're gonna like, it's literally like a piece of artwork. So if it takes a year, it takes a year. If it takes two years, it takes two years. Once it's ready, then we'll go sell it. Mm. And that's what we did. And that was the most beautiful experience I've had as a writer so far in 20 years because I didn't have a deadline. And I had a partner that heard me when I said, we're not turning this in until it's perfect. And we just kept working. We kept redoing it and redoing it and redoing it. I mean, there are sentences in this book that we finessed for weeks. Yes. You know, people think these little books are easy that you just boom, boom, boom. Like we spent over a year and a half writing this book. Yeah. I think sometimes uh, because I'm someone who pays so much attention to quality over quantity and we had a similar experience. I had just gone through the copy editing process for everything is figure outable. And I mean, the time that we spent on like three sentences coming back to it to get it just right, because it's so important. It's probably true for you guys too, to get that message right to make sure that it lands in someone's heart and in their mind. So hopefully there's a transformation in a way that that no other words could right. accomplish. Yeah, it's so exciting. So I just wanted to share that with you guys because sometimes you don't get to hear the behind the scenes. They just say like, oh my goodness, millions and millions of copies and all these bestsellers. And you never get to hear about what happens on the backside that there's a struggle. And also like, you know, with 7 million books out, I took my son Jack, who's 15 with me on the book pitch process. And he's like, Dad, you know, is this scary for you? And I'm like, yeah, because you know what? At the end of the day, I still have to sell it again, yeah. right? Like I have to sell the vision. And I think what I tell people who are entrepreneurs, all these people who are, you know, watching you, wanting to build their own business, the sales process never ends. You have to believe in your dream more than anyone else, right? If you don't believe in your dream, nobody else can believe in your dream. Yeah. And the fact that people will say no to you doesn't mean that no is right. It just means it's not right for them. Yes. And so as you know, as I took Jack on this pitching process and he watched me, he's like, wow, dad, you know, that was just amazing seeing, you know, you you do share this message so passionately. I'm like, well, that's what I do, Jack. I love this. And, yeah. I feel know. like it applies too for people that aren't entrepreneurs. Like when you have a dream, if you want to sell your dream to your family or you want to sell your dream to your community or you want to sell your dream totally. right to other people in whatever way that you're bringing a dream to life, you do have to keep on it. I mean, even in our partnership, selling your partner on the vision, and we'll talk about where you yep. guys are, not that that's too hard of a sell. Dave is going to spend some time in Italy, <laughs> which is amazing, but we'll talk about that later. Okay. Now, um, getting into the book itself. Self. Why is it a parable? Because you felt like it would be the easiest and and the most kind of digestible and people wouldn't resist it? Well, so stories transform people's lives, right? Like, Facts tell, stories sell. I mean, stories transform people's lives. And, and I've always had stories throughout my books. But even with all the books that I've sold, the reality is I, I believe, Marie, that 98% of people will never read a financial book. They need a financial book, right? Like we're going to talk about the reasons why people need this so much. Yes. But most people won't read a book on personal finance. Yeah. So I kept asking myself, how can I package something up that somebody can read in an hour that could completely change their whole life when it comes to their money? Yes. That could free them to go for their dreams. Yes. And then also selfishly, how can I write a book that my 15-year-old son would read? <laughs> and and then this is the first book that Jack's read. That's amazing. You know, Zane, my stepson, I introduced him to your book when he was about 13 and he, you know, rolled his eyes yeah. understandably. And I was trying to show him the table, some of which we'll go in later. I was like, Zane, he had um, just had this first job. And so there was this check of money. And he, I was like, Zane, look, if we invest this, we, you know, because he was, again, 13 at the time. What, she's, what, what Marie's talking about right now, well, maybe we'll cut, well, you'll cut this in, but yeah. this is the chart. Yes. It shows saving $2,000 a year, starting at the age of 19, only saving it till the age of 26. That's $5.41 a day. And by the time the person reaches 65, they have a million dollars. And here's the thing, Marie. So what, you're, you're a 13 year old? Yeah. This chart at the end of the, so Jack read this book in two hours and turned to me on a plane flight. I'll show you the pictures later. And he turns to me and he goes, dad, is this, is this real? And I go, yeah, it is real. And he goes, how do I get one of these accounts? <laughs> he goes, because because I could do this. He goes, I could do this. Yes. He goes, it's five dollars and forty one cents a day. I I could do this. So let's open. And he goes, and you started this at nineteen. What happens if it's at fifteen? He's like, you should rerun the numbers. I go, I actually have that chart too. He goes, well, let's open up. And I said, we're gonna do a Roth IRA for him. So here's the thing. This little chart is gonna 
change his life, but it changes anybody's life. It happens to be this little chart was shown to me at 26. Mm. At Morgan Stanley, by a financial advisor, retiring at 61, who told our training class, at a minimum, guys, this is what you need to do. And so something as simple as that little chart can change every, really can change anybody's life who's watching this. When you look at the math. Yes. It's the math that people don't understand. Like, I put all my best charts in this book, but there's a chart that shows somebody starting at 25, and they save $300 a month. And by the time they reach 65, they've got $1,913,000. Another person waits till 35, they've got $684,000. It's only 10 years later. Next, big difference. Big difference. Next person waits until they're 45 to save. They've got $230,000. The next person waits until they're 55 and they've got $62,000. And that was a lot of math to just show. Yeah. But what happens when you look at this is you just go, oh, I got to get going. Yes. And, and that's really the core message of this book is like wherever you are right now, get started. Yes. Because small amounts of money can change your whole life. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Well, it changed my life too. And again, if you guys didn't see our first episode together, you will. We'll link it below. But I first uh, read David's books. It was Smart Women Finish Rich. And it totally opened my eyes. I was like, I am going to get my shiz together. And now look at her. <laughs> look at her. <laughs> well, I, you know me. I'm an action taker, right? I know so you I are. saw those things and it really opened my eyes. And I was like, I can do this. I will do this. And I have done this. And this is why I get so excited to talk about money. And um, we will dive into some of those scary statistics right now because I watch the news sometimes and I see these – reports about how these incredible good folks all across our country and all across the yeah. world can get taken out. One bad decision, being ill, an accident, things that happen. You know, some of the stats right now, uh, let me see where I had these. I think it's, what is it? Seven out of 10 people describe themselves as living paycheck to paycheck. And right now, half of the people here in the US could not find an extra $400 in the event of an emergency. And I love... Um, you gotta, you gotta wait, like, like take one breath there for a second, because what you just said, I've talked about this now for four years. It's actually what led me to write this book. Um, four out of 10 Americans, almost half of America today cannot get their hands on $400 in case of an emergency. That means the average American has less than six days of expenses set aside. Six out of 10 Americans, Marie, have less than a thousand dollars in savings. Eight out of 10 women today in this country are living paycheck to paycheck. When you look at how this country is being torn apart politically right now and how divisive this country is becoming, it is because people are so struggling financially. Yes. So that's why what happened is, you know, with this book is I went to Geneva and had dinner with Paulo Coelho, the author of The Alchemist. Uh, our friend Brendan Burchard and I went over and I'd always wanted to meet Paulo. And I had, again, had this dream for this book for a long time. And over dinner and over drinks, Paulo looks at me, because his book was my biggest inspiration, The Alchemist. He looked at me and he said, David, what is the book that your heart desires to write that you have not yet done? And why? How's that for a question, by the way? It's a great one. And I proceed to tell him, I want to write this book called The Latte Factor that will translate all over the world because so many people are living paycheck to paycheck. And they're struggling. And if I can help free people financially, I know I can help them fix their lives. Because when you fix your finances, you fix your life. And so he looked at me and he goes, puts his hand on me and he goes, then David, you must write that book. Mm. And literally, I, you know, we, we closed that bar out. It was like three o'clock in the morning and I came home. I was on cloud nine and uh, I came home from that trip and my wife goes, Alicia, you know her. And she said, um, what did Paulo say? And I said, Paulo said I should write The Latte Factor. And she's like, I've been telling you that for 10 years. You yeah. go to Geneva to hear that? I'm like, well, it is Paulo Coelho. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, and, and for everyone thinking about it, The Latte Factor, you said, is never about coffee. It's not even about the money. And this is what's so important, you guys, to get. It's always been a metaphor to motivate and inspire dreamers to go live their dreams. This is huge because this was so much what I took out of this book of yours and why it's so important. Yeah. So, so let's dive in because it's not about necessarily being a penny pincher, is it's it? It's not. No. What, what, what the latte factor was always designed to do was be a metaphor that was like a light switch that makes people go, oh, I do have enough money to start investing. Because the number one reason people don't invest is they think, I don't, I, you know, I, I'm not rich. I don't have money. I can't get started. Yeah. And so I started showing the math of like $5 a day. If you're in your 20s, and in this case, the main character is Zoe Daniels. So... Her name, she's 27 years old. She's a millennial. 
and I really wrote this book to reach young people, to reach, to empower the next generation to save and invest. And she's 27 years old. She's working. She lives in Brooklyn. She's working in the Freedom Tower. She's in publishing. She's an editor of a travel magazine, but she never gets to travel. And after six years in the city, working super hard, making more money, she's still living paycheck to paycheck. And she's giving up hope, which is happening to a lot of millennials, by the way. They're, giving, they're, they're losing hope. And she, she starts to meet a series of mentors that teach her. You know, if you can afford to go have coffee every morning at the coffee shop, which funnily enough, you've got this massive coffee shop now down below this building, which wasn't here last time. Um, if you can afford to spend $5 on coffee, you can afford to change your whole life. And this mentor starts to show her that. And ultimately, the mentor who happens to work at a coffee shop says, you know, you don't actually have to give up your coffee. It could be something else. What you need to realize is that you have to become financially selfish. You have to put yourself first. And it starts with small, small amounts of money, like $5 a day, $10 a day, $15 a day. It's building the muscle financially that you deserve to keep. You deserve to keep part of your paycheck. And he runs her through the math of that. He's like, you're going to work 90,000 hours over your lifetime? You, you need to decide today to keep one hour a day of your income. And he starts to walk her through that. And the, 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 again, the latte powder is like, it's a metaphor. Yeah. I would say, I'm not trying to take your coffee away. I'm trying to get you to think <laughs> consciously. Yes. Are you spending money in a way that's going to get you closer to your dreams? Because if you're not, you're trapped. Big time. You're trapped. And, and many people today feel trapped. Yes. And that's one of the scariest places to feel. I felt that in my life. So many people can relate to that feeling now where yeah. you can't breathe and you don't know which way to turn and you don't know how to get help. And that's why this book is so genius because it it empowers you to help yourself. One thing that I love that Zoe, the main character, um, she first sees this sign. It's like a message she sees. It says, if you don't know where you're going, you might not like where you end up. Yeah. And I just want to settle for folks that are watching right now. Uh, you just heard David say, like, this book, he wrote this to empower young people. If you're in your 50s or 60s, no, David's got another book that's called Start Late, Finish Rich. So we'll get there too. So this is really for everyone. But there's never a bad time to take a pause and say, wait, have I been intentional about where I'm going? Well, that's the core message of this book. This is, the core message of The Latte Factor is waking up to where do you want to go with your life? Yeah. Are you actually present right now in your life. And so the book starts with Zoe Daniels coming out the, Ful the Fullerton Center. So for people who don't know, that's the center right downtown in New York City. And she comes out in the Oculus. And underground on the way to the Freedom Tower, there's an LCD screen that's the size of a football field. We're going to do a book signing event there. Oh, good. And on the LCD screen, she sees, if you don't know where you're going, you might not like where you end up. And she takes the escalator up above ground, and she comes out the 9-11 Memorial which is right next to the Freedom Tower where she works. For six years, she's never really taken in the 9-11 memorial. She's just come up, gone into the office. And on this morning, she looks at the 9-11 memorial and she sees people crying and she sits down on a bench and she asks herself, where is she going with her life? And that's the first chapter of the book. And that's a question we all need to be asking ourselves at any age. That's right. At any age. Where are you going with your life? Because things can change like that in a moment. Yes. And this is a book about not living a life of any regrets, which we'll talk later about, you know, my grandmother's story, how I weave that in there. But I want people to not live a life of regrets. Yeah. And I want you to be conscious in your life. And so the money is just a tool to start to free you up, to become more present in your life so you can think about these bigger things. Yes. So... Um I love that her first kind of mentor, Henry, replies when she says she can't afford a painting, right? When she's in the coffee shop and she's yeah. looking at this beautiful kind of travel photograph, actually not a painting. Um, and Henry replies, you're richer than you think. And he says, for most people, more income wouldn't help their situation at all. Talk to us about how we need to get out of this mentality if I just had more money. Well, it's it's really the American trap, right? What we are trained pretty much from birth here, go make more money, go make more money, go make more money. And as we make more money, we're then marketed to spend more. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you make more money is you have what's called lifestyle creep. 
It's not intentional. It's that you've been marketed to. So as you've been marketed to, you're supposed to have a nicer car. You're supposed to have a bigger home. You're supposed to have fancier clothes. You're supposed to have these brands. And so as we make more, look, we're all guilty of doing this. Yeah. I've done this myself. Yeah. As we make more money, we increase our expenses. And so New York City, where we are right now, is the classic example of this, where people make a whole lot of money. And you know, you see these articles where people are making a lot of money and they're still living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. And their stress level is even higher. And their unhappiness level is even higher. I, you know, if you work really, really hard and you keep making more money and making more money and you're not saving anything, you start to go, is it worth it? Yes. And so the, the secret to actually being happier and living rich, again, the message of this book is to live rich now. The secret is, and it's not going to sound fancy here, it's to actually live below your means. Yes. And so as you grow your income, if you can keep your lifestyle the same, if you get, you, you start to really have freedom. Yes. And you know, it's funny. Like, so we're going, as you know, we're going to Florence, right? And, and as we were going, my wife's in real estate. So as we're about to ready to go to Florence, my wife is looking at apartments that cost the same thing as what they cost in New York. And I said, no, honey, we're going to Florence. We can reduce our cost of living. I am sure in half. And she's like, oh, I didn't know you wanted to reduce our cost of living. I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> We're going to Italy. Save us some money. Well, our apartment's costing one third what our apartment here in New York costs. Amazing. And so it was by changing the paradigm, right? Because yes. we could have just kept spending the same amount of money. I'm like, no, let's go to Florence and let's focus on experience. Yes. Not on stuff. Yes. And, and that's another thing too. But we've been in this whole downsizing mode. You, you start to realize we accumulate so much stuff that we don't need. Yes. You know, as we've downsized to get ready to move and all the stuff's gone off to storage like three or four months ago, we sent all the stuff to storage. I, was, I don't even know what's in storage anymore. Yeah. So why do we need all this stuff? Right. And then right? paying for the storage and pay for the stuff that you forget is even there. Yeah. I loved the one line in the book. It says, everyone spends money every day. And as they do, they're building wealth. Everyone builds wealth. The only question is, for whom? I was like, bam, that yeah. is a question. What does that mean? Well, so the, the, where that example comes from is actually my grandmother teaching me about money starting at the age of seven. So at seven years, I learned about money from my grandmother Rose Bach. She was broke at 30, didn't have a college education, worked at Gimbel's department store, sold wigs, like poor. And at 30 made a decision she was tired of being poor. She was tired of being trapped. And made a decision to start brown bagging her lunch. All of her friends teased her. Why are you brown bagging your lunch? Come on up to lunch with us. And she said, I'm going to start saving and investing. And she saved a dollar a week. And through that effort, started investing. And over her lifetime, always tell us that, over her lifetime, decades, she became a self-made millionaire. And then she taught myself and my sister and my father how to invest. And she helped me buy my first stock at seven. So at seven years old at McDonald's, she taught me this lesson. The lesson was you go to McDonald's and she's like, David, you can be a kid who comes and eats here. You can be somebody who works here for minimum wage, or you can be somebody who owns this place. Minimum wage, that person who's working for minimum wage, very hard way to make a living. You're here as a spender, eating McDonald's, which you love, but you could also make money from every single person that's here. So she's like, I'm gonna teach you today how to own McDonald's. And she did, she literally took me home, opened up the Wall Street Journal, circled MCD, explained to me how to buy stock, explained to me how to be an owner not a buyer. She's like, and it's fine, by the way, if you want to go to McDonald's, once you own it, you can make money from yourself. <laughs> and and this, this, the example that's in the book actually is Starbucks, yeah. ironically, right? Because the mentor takes her to Starbucks and says, you know, I started buying Starbucks. Hey, I don't want to get the whole story away, but basically says to her, you know, when Starbucks opened, he had a coffee shop. And when Starbucks opened, all of his friends were complaining about Starbucks opening. And he's like, I'm going to just buy the stock. And by the way, if you bought $1,000 worth of Starbucks stock when Starbucks started today, you'd have over a quarter of a million dollars in stock. Oof. So I'm like, great. You want to go to Starbucks and have coffee? Then buy the stock. Yeah. Right? Like if you're going to have a Netflix problem where you, you know, get yeah. on the stock, right? Yeah. Like own what you use because investors get rich. And the other example that gets used here is there's two escalators to wealth in America. Really the world, but the two primary escalators to wealth. It's owning stocks and owning real estate. And so Zoe's mentor, Henry, teaches her, you've got to be in the game of owning stocks and owning real estate. What's happening, Marie, right now in this world is everybody's getting, as a small percentage of people are getting richer and everybody else is getting poorer, is that the game is rigged and the game is rigged for rich people. 
And in order to be one of those rich people, you have to own two asset classes, real estate and stocks. You have to, because if you're not, you're not on this escalator, because mm. everything's set up for those two asset classes to go up. Yeah. The taxes are set up to go up for those people. And the Trump, the, the Trump tax law change helped the stock market keep going. So it's just, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here, but it's like, you need to know how to play the game. There's a game being played that involves money. And if you don't know the rules, you're going to lose the game. So again, what I tried to do with the latte factor was like, here's a book that anybody can read. My 15 year old read it. You can read it in less than 90 minutes. And you can know like the 99% of basic rules you need to know about personal finance to win at the game. Yes. I want to talk about the myths that Zoe's uh, other mentor, Barbara, her boss, teaches her. One myth. Most people think they have an, um, well, basically the myth is you need to make more money and yeah. then you'll be rich. And I loved this. Most people think they have an income problem. They don't. They have a spending problem. So <laughs> that was amazing. Myth number two, it takes money to make money. Like we've talked about, five, ten dollars a day can absolutely change your life. And then I loved myth number three, someone else will take care of it for you. This I think is so big for so many people, assuming that whether it's their boss yeah. or an accountant or a lawyer or a husband or a wife, that someone else is kind of managing it and taking care of it and just kind of burying your head in the sand. Yeah. Two things. Let me just go to the the, the math one more time, though. On the ten, because we were talking about the, before we started yeah. the ten dollars a day. Oh, let's that, go to that. Cause, yeah, because the ten dollars a day. If you could just save ten dollars a day and you invested it and you paid yourself first in a retirement account, in forty years we show you at ten percent you could have almost two million dollars. Yes, it's like one, $1 million eight hundred ninety-seven thousand two two four. Yep. <laughs> two, two, thank you. Yes. So someone go wait a minute. What ten dollars a day in forty years I could have one million eight hundred ninety-seven thousand dollars. Yeah, you could potentially. And by the way, 10% is what the stock market has averaged since 1926. Now, people go, oh, I could never get 10%. Okay, fine, you can reduce the rate. Maybe it's, and I give you the numbers, it could be 9% or 8% or 7% or 5%. Even at half, you'd still have almost a million dollars. $10 a day. So that's a great place to start for somebody who's not starting. Now, for a whole lot of people watching, it could be $20 a day or $30 a day. It's coming up with your daily dollar amount. But one thing I think is so important is to come up with that daily dollar amount because that's the daily dollar amount that can change your life. Yes. And we want to challenge people right now, right? Should we just do it? Yeah. I mean, let's do it. Like, I, what Because I, what I like to see people do, like, let's just use $10 a day, for example. Yeah. But you could pick any number. Is come up with a, a hundred. I would give you a 100-day challenge because it would be cool if your community all did this. Yes. Pick a number and challenge each other to save this amount for, 10, for 100 days. At $10 a day, if we could get everybody watching to save $10 a day, in 100 days, you'd have more than 60% of American savings, which is kind of insane. It's amazing. Right? But for some people, they could go, well, it's $20 a day or $30 a day. It could be a dollar a day. I, I think the thing that's been so cool for us, we did a pre-launch of this book with our community um, on our website. It's thelattefactor.com, and we got a bunch of people in a Facebook community. And there's like 1,300 people right now in this insider group. And they're all supporting each other, yeah, right? And it's been so amazing to me to see each other, cheer, see everybody cheer each other on. And I know your community does this. So I think if you, could, if you guys could all go do this, like pick a dollar amount and Absolutely. challenge each other for 100, 100 days. days. Yes. And then just keep checking in with each other. Like, hey, I'm on day 27. Yes. Here's what I've got. Yes. I'm on day 42. Here's what I've got. Hey, you know what? I was doing great and I got off track. No worries. You know what? You can get back on track, right? Because it is like, in a way, exercise or dieting. It's this daily thing. You can get off track, but you can get back on track. That's right. And the thing I love, too, about bringing in that community piece, especially around money, is there's so much shame around yeah. the topic of money. And people are so afraid of it, understandably. And people feel so totally. bad and feel so guilty and feel that they've messed up and maybe they're beyond, oh no, I've made so many mistakes in the past. It's like, no, 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 no. Let's start fresh right now. And that bit about community. So guys, take the challenge. 100 days, whatever your number is, we're throwing out 10, but it could be one, it could be three, it could be 20, it could be 30, whatever it is, go for it. One, so we just don't go past this. Yeah. Too. We talk about um, not depending on somebody else. Cause I, cause I, I, I very intentionally focus this post, that part also on women. Yeah. So I always, I, you know, I've been a crusader for women and money for, for two, 26 years. I've been teaching women and money seminar programs and smart women finish rich now for 20 years. Um, I don't care if you're married to local bank president as a woman, you've got to be in charge of your finances. 80% of men die married. 80% of women die widowed. And the bulk of women 
who end up poverty stricken were not poverty stricken before their husband died. So there's a message in this book for women also, very intentionally, that you have to be the master of your own money. Yes. I guess an amen from me I mean, every day of the week. Yes. And it's not guys that I don't want you to be in charge of your own money too, but it's just for, for, for uh, you know, this has been my core passion for 26 years because of my grandmother. Yes. You've got to be in charge of your own financial life and you need to take power over your own financial life. And the, you know, you talked about being intimidated and scared and feeling guilty. Here's the truth. Everything that's in the latte factor should have been taught in school before you got out of high school. Yes. And if it was, everybody would do better because when you know better, you do better. So it's not your fault if you didn't know this stuff, but you can fix it. Yes. I and mean, now it's your responsibility. You can fix it. As an adult, too. I know, you know, I get so passionate about women and money because it's like for millennia, we weren't allowed, not allowed to own property. I mean, I was just working on my book, and it, I think it was as recent as in the 1970s in some states here in America a woman couldn't get bank credit unless she had her husband's permission. It's like, what the, are you kidding me? My grandmother, when she went to the first brokerage firm after yeah. she saved all the money, yes, the broker said to her, we don't open accounts for women, come back with your husband. <laughs> right, I, like when I tell that story, the audience is just go, what? Yeah. But that's how it was not that long ago. Yeah, and so many of us as women are still carrying around vestiges of those old ideas, generational, generational, yes. generational inner poverty based on institutional structures, and we have to change that now. So that's why I get so excited about this book. So thank you for driving that home. Um, what I love also about all of your work is it's clear and it's actionable. So let's talk about the three secrets to financial freedom. And I think what's great about these secrets is they're hiding in plain sight, right? They're not really secrets. So uh, number one, pay yourself first. What's that mean? So pay yourself first means that when you're in a paycheck, the first person who gets paid is you. Th this is the single most important financial lesson that you could ever learn. You have to become, I say in the book, financially selfish. You have to decide that that first hour day of your income, it's coming right off the top to you. So if you have a job and you go to work at nine and you work till five, the first hour day of your income gets taken right off the top, goes into a retirement account before you can touch it. Happens to be the math on that is 12 and a half percent of your gross income. Mm. You start saving one hour day of your income when you're in your 20s, you'll be financially free for life. Now, as you get older, if, you, if you're behind, you need to save more than that. It's, it can go up to two hours a day. But it's a mindset of, I'm going to get paid first. I'm going to pay myself first before I pay taxes, before I pay my mortgage, before I pay rent, before I pay my bills. Most people do everything. They pay all their bills first, and they try to save last. It doesn't work. And what we know is the way people in America who become self-made millionaires, specifically like in retirement accounts, they literally, I can give you, there's, mat, there's a formula. It happens to be it's 14% of your gross income is what the, the average self-made millionaire that's become a millionaire by the age of 59, according to Fidelity, save 14% of their gross income. Yeah. That's a little over one hour day of your income. Wow. And so there's a, like Henry walks, you know, Zoe through the math of this. Yes. But when you think about it in terms of time, and I know a lot of people who are watching are self-employed. And so there are going to be all kinds of questions like, well, how do I do this? I don't have a, I don't have a salary. You have to think about it still the same way. Money comes in, you've got to pay yourself first. So, and it's hard when you're self-employed because your income's not consistent. But you have to decide. You have to decide. Check comes in, percentage gets taken right off the top, goes into another account that I can't touch to pay myself first. That's right. I don't even care if it's just one or two percent. It is a mindset and a discipline. And you do that, you put yourself first, you will become financially free. Mm. Okay. Mm. Secret number two. Mm. Mm. Don't budget. This is a good one. It, make it automatic yeah. instead. This is secret number two. So don't budget because budgeting doesn't work. Yeah. If it worked, everybody would do it and everybody would start them and everybody would stick to them. Um, I, you know, I've spent 26 years in the financial service industry. Um, my first nine years were at Morgan Stanley and what I saw firsthand, in nine years, I only had one client write a check discipline-wise from budgeting. For, for six months or more. The, everybody who saved, they, the one that all my clients that really saved money, it was all automated. Mm. So the message of, of budgeting is instead of budgeting, you need to save automatically for whatever you're saving for. Saving for an emergency account, you save automatically. Money gets moved automatically into an emergency account. 
Want to save for a dream trip to go to Italy? Money gets moved automatically into an Italian account, your Italy account. Yeah. You're going to save for retirement, it gets moved automatically into a retirement account. And so it's it's this concept of instead of using discipline and willpower, willpower remembering, and, you know, driving yourself crazy because budgets actually do drive couples to fight. If instead you can focus on what you're going to save automatically and where, you can eliminate all the fights. Love it. How about live rich now? I think this is the big one because you said the first two secrets, pay yourself first and make it automatic. Those are the how. This is the why. Figure out what matters and follow that. Yes, and it gives me chills because um, you know I talked about my sabbatical that I had taken last time I was on your show, yeah, which a lot of people actually really resonated with. Yes, um, the idea of living rich now. Before I go on the sabbatical discussion, the idea of living rich now is: what do you really want to do with your life that you're not doing, and how can you live rich today instead of thinking you need a bunch of money to someday live rich? What could you do today to live rich? What what's something that like? You know, I wake up in the morning and I meditate. That's a live rich moment for me, right? I write in my journal and I write down my gratitude in the morning. That's a moment for, for 15 minutes. I'm very present and I'm living rich. What can you do today to live rich? Mm. Because, you know, the subtitle of this book, Why You Don't Have to Be Rich to Live Rich, which I thank you for because we talked about it on the first show and it resonated so much with your viewers and then going all over the world. Um, the message of this is that you don't actually have to have a whole lot of money yes. to feel rich. Yes. What you need to do to feel rich is not feel trapped. Because the opposite of, of living rich is feeling trapped. So one thing that I tell people to do is like, think about what in your life right now is making you maybe feel trapped. How could you eliminate that? Mm -hmm. And what would it feel like to not feel trapped? <laughs> What does that look like to you? Yeah. What, what do you need to add to your life today that probably doesn't even take money that would make you feel better about your life today? Yes. That's living rich. I love it. So as we get to the end of the book, you start to explain a little bit about your beautiful grandmother again. Will you share what you talk to her about at the end of her life? So I'm almost going to get choked up thinking about this. Um, so my grandmother was my role, was really my role model and my mentor. And she lived to be 86. And at 86, she had a stroke. And we moved her into a nursing care facility in Northern California by my office. And I didn't know that I, I thought that she was gonna live forever. You know, and so when I sat when I was with her at the nursing care facility, I asked her a question which was, did she have any regrets? The reason I asked her this question, Marie, is because I was finishing Smart Women Finish Rich. It's back in 1997. So she knew I was writing the book and it was dedicated to her. And I was like, do you have any more lessons for me? And I said, do you have any regrets? And she said, no. Then the next day I came in to pick see her. And I'm like, how are you? And she's like, I'm terrible. I was up all night long thinking about my regrets. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, grandma, I'm so sorry. But then she took me through five of her regrets. And you know, she'd had a stroke, so she couldn't speak very well. Yeah. But she went through what they were, all the way back to being a teenager. And then she said to me, the lesson's not in what I'm regretting. The lesson's in why I'm regretting it. And that's what I want you to hear from me right now. She said, my regrets are that at all those moments, I came to a fork in the road where I had to make a decision. Do I go this way where, where the gold is, where, where, the, where what I really want to do is this road, but that's where the risk is? Or do I take the safer road? And she said, at every one of those points in time, I made the decision to take the safer route. And she's like, I am dying right now. I'm never going to leave this bed. And I'm never going to know what could have been. And so she said to me, she said, I don't want you to make the same mistake. And so she said, when you come to the fork in the road, there's going to be like a little boy inside you that wants to go do this. And then there's going to be this big boy that's like scared. Yeah. And she's like, don't listen to the big boy, right? So I went back to my office and I actually broke down, like here, I can't believe I'm so embarrassed. But no, I, I, you I, I broke, this is I, life, yes. I broke down crying, in my, sitting in my car, crying in my office. And I looked in the rearview mirror and I'm like, I wanted to leave Morgan Stanley. I wanted to go spend my life making a difference, teaching women at the time, yeah. specifically to be smarter with money. Yeah. And 
I felt trapped. I wanted to get out of this corporate box. I had this bigger dream. And I, I, I looked in this rearview mirror and I looked at myself after breaking down crying. I was like, okay, David, in three years, we're going to get you out of here. Yeah. And we're going to go, go for your dreams. And that led me, it took four years. That led me to being in New York, moving in, leaving Morgan Stanley, moving to New York, writing 13 more books and spending <laughs> the last 18 years doing this. Yes. And, you know, the, the, the most amazing part of this story is that, so my son Jack read this book on this plane flight like two weeks ago, flying home from Utah. After he talked about the IRA account, I said to him, what was your biggest takeaway from the book? And he looked at me and he said, you know the story about your grandmother? I go, yeah. He goes, the takeaway was to take risk. And then he said, you know, dad, because he was given a choice about going to Florence. So we're getting ready to move to Florence with the family for a year. And the whole, one of the big reasons was to take him as a sophomore to live in Florence for a year before, before he goes off to college. Yes. And he, but we had, what we gave him a choice, which is a huge thing to give a 15 year old kid. And he chose, yes, I want to go. And he looked at me and he said, dad, if I hadn't chosen to go to Florence, it would have been my first regret. Mm. And he's like, so I learned from the book, I need to take risk in life. And I was just like, oh my God, I, I, I did everything I wanted to do with this little <laughs> book. Like I just impacted my 15 year old with these two huge life lessons. Yeah. So, you know, if I can go just reach some more people now besides my 15-year-old son with this book, we're going to really, it'll be amazing. Oh, millions of people are going to read this book. I loved it. The reason I'm crying now, too, is because I loved it. It was like, um, just to put a little pin in this, you know, are you listening to the big boy or are you listening to the little boy who wants to play? The little boy inside who wants to play. Who and says, the little girl inside or the big girl inside. That's right. And one thing my grandmother said to me too at the time was she's like, it's not always your own voice. Like that big girl can be your mom or your society. boss. Or society. That's right. Or your tribe. Yeah. Right. Like we can get caught up listening to other people's voices and lose sight of our own voice. I go back to it's you got to listen to your soul. Yeah. Right. Like. Being present in your life so you can listen to your soul and let your soul come out and then go play the game that your soul wants to play. That's right. Thank you so, so much. I am so thrilled that you wrote this book. I'm so thrilled Thank that we're you. having this conversation again. Um, you're just, you've made a huge difference in my life, a huge difference to our audience. And I'm really, really excited for all of you guys to get this book, to share it with the people that you love, to share it with your kids, with your friends, with your team, with your employees. It really is important because yes, money is an important topic. It is about freedom, but it really, underneath it all, it's about listening to that small voice, listening to your soul and following your dreams. David, I adore you. I love you. Thank you I so much. You. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Now, David and I would love to hear from you. So we talked about so many important things today. I'm curious, what is the biggest insight that you're taking away from today's conversation? And most importantly, how can you turn that insight into action starting right now? Leave a comment below and let us know. Now, as always, the best conversations happen after the episode over at marieforleo.com. So head on over there and leave a comment now. When you're there, be sure to sign up for our email list and become an MF Insider. You're going to get instant access to an audio I created called How to Get Anything You Want, plus some exclusive content, special giveaways, and some personal updates for me that I just don't share anywhere else. Stay on your game and keep going for your dreams because the world really does need that special gift that only you have. Thank you so much for watching and we'll catch you next time on Marie TV. Are you tired of talking into an empty void? Are you ready for more sales, more clients, and more raving fans? Take our free seven-day writing class at thecopycure.com. Again, the latte powder is like, it's a metaphor. Yeah. I would say, I'm not trying to take your coffee away. I'm trying to get you to think <laughs> consciously. Yes. Are you spending money in a way that's going to get you closer to your dreams? Because if you're not, you're trapped.